Uh, our next guest is going to be Dr. Jeff Kloon. He's at the University of Wyoming. Uh, you may have, if you've been paying attention to the live stream, you probably heard him uh, just before this. He was part of the panel that finished up just as we started. And uh, he's going to walk in right now, pick up a microphone, and we'll just start going. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody. See, he's a pro. This is great. All right. Well, Dr. Kloon, lovely to see you. Hello. Thank you. Um, we'll dive right into it. Uh, a lot of your work is focused on uh, spoofing and, and basically ways that a bad actor could feed bad data into an AI learning and how that could impact things. Things like, you know, uh, an example that was used earlier during your panel was uh, somebody says this empty street, it's actually a street full of children and a car drives through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, based on the research you've done up top, are people starting to, to experiment with doing this kind of spoofing now? And how much of a concern is it for those focused, particularly on the military side? Yeah, sure. So the short answer is that people have done a lot of experimentation to show that these concerns are not merely academic curiosities, but they're relatively pervasive and easy to, um, to enact. So people have, for example, taken uh, systems that recognize, say, a stop sign, and they, this is work out of Don Song's lab at the University of Berkeley, they have kind of gotten stickers. You know, people frequently put stickers on a stop sign that says, like, stop hate, for example. Right. And they could just put on a sticker that says stop hate, but embedded in that sticker is a pattern that makes a system, for example, on a self-driving car that knows how to recognize stop signs to see that as a speed limit 75 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. So the exact opposite of what you'd want which is that the car should stop, it'll actually say, oh, I should speed up and maybe rush through an intersection. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk today, people have put on glasses that can have patterns on them that fool a face recognition system into thinking that, say, I am uh, a certain actress or that, you know, you're a grandmother, et cetera. And um, there's c example after example after example where these systems, which are extremely powerful, are also extremely foolable and hackable and therefore manipulatable. And so it's a real concern, and um, many people have been trying to solve this problem, and so far it's resisted the best minds for years, as I mentioned. Uh, and so the, basically the research challenge is on to try to solve the problem, but also for people who are actively deploying it to think about and recognize that these problems exist. And so you should not rely on the fact that uh, your system is perfect, and if you have an adversary, you should be especially careful. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of curious about is the question of perfect versus good. Uh, you know, Dr. Fisher mentioned a couple of times about how uh, people aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. and people make mistakes and we hold automation to a certain level as maybe uh, an unfair standard compared to people. At the same time, if the idea is you take some of the stuff out of people's hands, you have to be able to trust that. So what's the balance? How do you find the sweet spot between needing to be completely correct and accurate and making it realistic for use? Yeah, well, I think it very much depends on the application and the consequences of when something goes wrong. So if Facebook is trying to figure out whether or not I like pictures of surfing versus pictures of food, it doesn't really matter if it, me if it messes up. Now, there may be some adversary, like a person who's trying to game the system and get some sort of unwanted ad through their filters or something, and so there can be consequences. I don't want to pretend that there aren't. But it's obviously different than, for example, a self-driving car or a system that is uh, denying loans to people or sentencing people to longer sentences. Um, and so you, uh, I think all, you know, in some systems, you are okay with uh, empirical estimates of reliability. So if I could, for example, make a, a self-driving car, and I knew that it was better than humans at driving by a few orders of magnitude, and I could show that over a tremendous amount of miles, maybe you'd trust it even though it's not perfect, because we're not perfect either. And if the system statistically is better, then that's fine. But as you see in this, the realm of, for example, computer security, a system might look pretty good for a very long period of time until suddenly somebody steals all your money. Well, that's not OK. Uh, there's like tremendous consequences to the one-off error there, and therefore, then it's not about kind of statistical reliability. It might be more about formal methods that prove that the system is unhackable. So uh, it's hard to give a blanket answer to the question, and every person who's deploying these systems needs to think very carefully about the ways that their system can be hacked and exploited and the consequences of failure. Particularly when it comes to military systems, I mean, how do you build in the type of security and, and capability you need to be able to trust? Um, we've heard a lot, you know, this won't be used to decide strike at this point. It's a big thing. There's always a human there for strike, but the data collection and the data processing that determines who to be struck is something that could be impacted by this. So from a, a DOD perspective or a foreign defense minister perspective, how concerning is the idea of, of this challenge and how do you try to m match that challenge? 
Yeah, well, I just want to quickly raise it for things like that, even if you're not striking, but you're just kind of analyzing and trying to detect potential targets uh, or potential suspects, that you have to not only worry about false positives, which is when you call somebody uh, a target or an, a person of interest when they're not, but probably more interestingly, you have to worry about false negatives. So, for example, I can make the system uh, not detect that I'm a bad actor by carefully fooling and, uh, and layering in some information that prevents them from seeing me for who I am if I'm a person on a watch list or seeing my pattern of behavior as uh, malicious or suspicious uh, when it obviously is by using some of these techniques. Um, so the again, you just kind of have to recognize that the systems are imperfect and you want to think about ways to use them and harness their benefits to the best that you can while you know, thinking about the potential downside. So a system that serves up suggestions of things to look into, things to analyze more, is a pretty good system until you start assuming that it's always suggesting all the things that you need to look at. Uh, and there's just not no simple answer. These are tools. They're imperfect tools, just like imperfect humans. You know, you give a job to a certain employee, they're going to do a pretty good job, hopefully. They're not going to do a perfect job. And you never assume that. So maybe you give it to a bunch of people. Maybe you, give, you do some random you know, checking and selection. And generally, you just game and plan for the fact that you are dealing with imperfect tools. I mean, along those lines, then, how do you deal with uh, potential distrust from people who are using these things? How do you get over the point of people saying, well, these aren't perfect, we can't be totally sure, I don't feel as comfortable trusting a machine as if I just checked it myself? Yeah, I think the, that comes down to um, just empirical reliability. Uh, you know, if you have a system that's been reliable for a very long time and it's better than uh, your best employee, then you're probably going to use it. Uh, there may be some human factors, some people may be more distrustful, some people less, but I think ultimately it kind of shows just like a running track record. And this is probably true with you. Probably the first time you engage cruise control, you're pretty suspicious. Right. Probably the first time you engage the kind of cruise control that automatically breaks when there's a car in front of you, you're probably pretty suspicious. After you saw it work like a thousand times, you probably just kind of assume that it's going to work. Now there can be problems. It could fail and it could cause an accident. So. Uh, you know, this is just kind of a very tough area where as the systems get better, we trust them more, and then they fail once in a while, and we are complacent. So um, that same lesson of the, the car driving it applies to every deployment of this AI technology, and there's not much we can do about it. Uh, last one I'll ask you about this. Um, you mentioned during the panel the idea of hubris, that it's hubris to say at some point machines won't be able to eclipse us and... Uh, essentially be able to do stuff. We won't even understand what they're doing, but they're doing, they're processing this at a higher level than we'll be able to handle. Uh, is that likely to come anytime soon? And how, especially again on the on a military side where some of these decisions are life or death, uh, how does that play out? Yeah, so the history of technological predictions is littered with false predictions. Typically people are a bit too aggressive when they make predictions. Um, but usually people, because they were too aggressive, write off the prediction and the prediction ends up coming true just a little bit down the road or maybe a lot bit down the road. You know, uh, it's 2017, we still don't have flying cars and jetpacks, but we almost have flying cars and jetpacks uh, deployed at scale. They're coming actually relatively soon. So um, it's very hard to know when this will happen. Uh, it's very hard to know, and it won't be a binary event. You know, there are cases now where AI is better. Like AI's, our computers have been better than humans at multiplying large numbers for uh, based since the dawn of computers. Right. And now, in many cases, like uh, deep neural networks are better than doctors at looking for uh, at looking at medical images and detecting whether or not there's malignant or benign tumors, at least at scale, where humans become fatigued and they become bored, etc. Uh, so it's kind of like it's basically going to be a slow, steady march of AI becoming increasingly more competent than us in an increasing number of areas. Uh, but there also could be a nonlinear event where suddenly the pieces come together in the right way in the software. You know, and we've seen, for example, in AlphaGo Zero, the most recent paper and some recent work by AI, that AI playing itself can actually teach itself very rapidly how to do something amazing. So as was said earlier today, humans have been playing Go for around 2,500 years. AI played itself and figured out how to beat the best human player in seven days. It didn't have access to the books that human read, to 40 years of experience or however old the champion was, et cetera. It figured out in seven days how to do something that's taken us, you know, centuries or millennia actually to do well at. So there could be a nonlinear event. Eventually AI teaches itself and suddenly becomes really good. And, um, you know, it's probably not, it's, it's not really a question of, um, 
is it extremely likely? I think the more interesting question is, is there a decent probability of that happening? And if so, we probably should be spending a lot of time thinking about it, because even a low probability of something that might be civilization ending is something that we should spend some time on. All right, well, on that happy note, <laughs> exactly. there you go. <laughs> Jeff Kloon is with the uh, University of Wyoming, and we're going to get our next guest in here. Jeff, thanks very much. Thank you.